want to say good morning, but I don't know when you're going to be watching this. Um, so second lecture of the first day. Uh, hopefully this uh, continues to work. Again, new technology for me, uh, but uh, as promised, a, a quick overview of sort of the historical um, ideas of the class. So uh, we're going to look at the Civil War. Uh, we're going to do our writing. We're going to do our literature. We're going to do all of that based around the Civil War as sort of a thematic strand that holds the whole class together. Uh, so let's let's do an overview really quickly. Um, again, I think history, it's important to place um, everything on a timeline in your head. And it's not just, hey, there's a timeline of world events. Let's have a timeline of technology. Let's have a time not, timeline of, um, you know, culture and and what's going on and i think that you know all of these things simultaneously work in your mind to create a picture of history and that picture of history is what allows you to sort of understand the context when i was in school when i was you know your age um i don't know that i had a great sense of the overall timeline of history i learned things in history class but they were sort of separate and compartmentalized and um i didn't have a real real great sense of what things were in relation to other things and sort of the cause and effects that that work through them all. So anyway, um, the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, um, that's the timeline we're talking about. So when we look at um, sort of uh, the world context of this, um, here's, a, here's a map of the world in 1861. Um, this United States looks all United Statesy, uh, but the truth is that there were a lot of territories in the middle that weren't really states yet, and you know stuff like that. But uh, you can see all the pink. Uh, this is a time period that's called the Victorian Age. Uh, Queen Victoria was ruling in the United Kingdom, and um, you can see everything that's pink was owned by England. Uh, so we've got Canada, we've got uh, Jamaica, we've got. Um, South Africa, we've got India, we've got Australia, um, you know, all, the British Empire was expanding, it had massive influence, um, that was going on, you had a lot of uh, European um, colonization going on, um, the colonial uh, empires, you can see that France owned Algeria, and uh, you know, Germany was starting to get into the game, into, you know, Africa, and so was, um, actually, well, Germany's not really doing that until slightly after the Civil War. What, whatever the case, Germany's not Germany. It's a bunch of little tiny countries like Prussia and um, Bavaria and, you know, anyway, it's, it's like five o'clock here, so my brain is not 100% awake yet. Um, you can see Portugal uh, has colonies everywhere, and Spain has a number of colonies as well, including the Philippines and um, Cuba, among others. So um, that's sort of the world that we're getting into, um, and it's sort of nice to picture the Civil War of America in the world context, because whenever you learn it in in a school environment, they they often, you know, it's just you're learning United States history and it's somehow unconnected, but everything's connected and always has been. Uh, so I think that world context helps you out. Let's let's talk a technology context. What what does 1861 to 1865 look like in terms of technology? Um, this is New York City uh, at the time. You can see that it's horse drawn carriages were before automobiles, but we are um, after trains. We are before aircraft, but there are hot air balloons. So um, the height of technology right now is sort of steam locomotives and steam steam powered ships. Uh, ships still have sails, but they also have um, propellers and uh, boilers and you know coal powers them. And so we've we're moved into what we call the industrial revolution. Um, in fact, the Civil War is going to be the first truly industrial conflict. I think you could argue that, and we'll talk about that later, too. Uh, however, the war is fought with old technology. Um, you know, the, the primary weapon that the soldiers used was called the musket. It's a rifled musket. What rifling is, is, is sort of a spiraling on the inside of the barrel that 
shoots the musket ball and the musket ball will spin and that makes it more accurate. Uh, but in order to load one of these muskets, you had to put um, the ball in the top and then ram it down with a ramrod. It's a relatively slow process. Um, it would be fired with a firing pin back here. You put like a little cap with powder in it and it sets it off and it blasts it out. But it, it takes a long time. Um, there's a couple of different rifles. We actually have this one at my parents' house. Um, this is the bayonet that attaches to it. It's essentially a sword, but this is a different kind of bayonet that, you know, it's like a stabby one. Um, but there are revolvers and there are these things called carbines that um, the cavalry would use. Um, and essentially the warfare at the time, let me go back to um, my overview. Um, the, t the technology here is that the warfare was, was there were three branches of, conflict on land you had infantry you had cavalry and you had artillery and these three things had been the same since the revolutionary war and essentially tactics uh remained the same throughout throughout the time period as well you lined all your guys up and they would march at each other in these giant square formations of guys and then they would stand there and like shoot each other and whoever side gave up first lost and this is a a tactic that goes back a long long time and and actually has its roots in medieval times and how medieval battles were fought which had their roots in in roman times and how roman battles were fought and so the the thought process on tactics at the beginning of uh, the Civil War was very much based on the Napoleonic Wars, which is the most recent set of wars in um, European memory. So um, this guy, Napoleon Bonaparte in France, uh, occupied all the way into Russia and had a big empire going on in, in France. And his basic tactic was march to the sound of the guns. And so um, it was a very offensive, very, very, uh, I don't know, offensive minded military tactic. And uh, that was sort of the, the basis for a lot of what Civil War generals tried to do. But as you'll see, technology changed as the war went on and uh, it made offensive tactics a lot less effective. Uh, even the rifled musket, which Napoleon didn't have, made offensive tactics a lot less less effective because the rifled musket had a longer range and better accuracy than muskets in Napoleon's day. And so as you, as you march towards your enemy, you'd lose more and more guys. Um, so anyway, um, that's your technology context. I think you get a sense of where we are sort of like on the technology chart. Um, again, the civil war has, has two sides. It has the union and it has the Confederacy. And these two sides are incredibly different. Um, the Union is is often called the North, um, and they were generally anti-slavery, and they were uh, far more industrial. When we start looking at at the causes of the war, um, really, slavery is the main cause. I, I don't know how you can you can say it's not. Um, there was a big abolitionist movement in the North, um, and uh, the North had a higher population and uh, was gaining more and more control of the United States government and the South was concerned that, you know, the North was going to abolish slavery and destroy essentially their way of life. And so the real, you know, meat of what caused the Civil War is is the question of slavery. And there's there's no getting around that. There's a lot of sort of false narratives out there um, about how it was about right states' rights and, and things like that. And that's it's just not really. Anyway, uh, so when you look at the map, um, what ended up happening was uh, after the United States Constitution was ratified, essentially uh, southern states were allowed to have slavery, but the northern states had abolished it. And so every time a new state came into the Union, uh, the southern states wanted that state to be allowed as a slave state so that they would continue to have equal political power with the northern states and the northern states didn't want any more slave states because they thought the the um slave trade was you know abominable and shouldn't happen and so they tried to um make sure that all new states that came into the union were were free states and so you ended up with this thing called the mason dixon line uh and basically states that were underneath it were allowed to come into um the united states as as slave states and states that were 
above it were not. Uh, but this created sort of a duality of culture, uh, and that's that's something that we should talk about. So, um, in fact, um, let's let's just talk about the slave trade really quickly. Um, a lot of people will point out that that America was not the worst uh, place for this. Uh, obviously, when you start looking at the numbers, um, you're like, hey, you know, like we we only took in 0.5 million compared to Brazil's 5 million. That's that's an enormous difference. It's true. Uh, these statistics look good, but they're not really true statistics. What what ended up happening was. Uh, America abolished importing slaves, but what we ended up doing was uh, creating like a essentially a breeding program within the United States. So we weren't bringing them from Africa anymore. We were, um, you know, having them have kids and then taking those kids away from their parents and selling them to others. And, you know, it was a. It's, it's definitely a stain on the the history of our country and um you know from a moral perspective it makes the south the bad guys i mean i don't think there's any way to to, to look around that um you know it's it's morally reprehensible to own and mistreat other human beings and i think everybody can agree with that anyway um so it, you know some people will throw statistics at you but but the truth is that at the time of the Civil War, um, I think the Southern population was somewhere around 11 million. And of those 11 million, I think 5 million were enslaved people. Um, and so that I think that gives you an idea of the scale. It's almost half of the population. So the real cause of the Civil War is slavery. And, you know, it's rooted in some of these other things. And, and we can talk about that. So economics. Um, the economies of the two sides, the North and the South, were, were not at all equal. Um, the Northern economy was based on industrialization primarily. Uh, the Industrial Revolution happened, and most of the industry in the United States at the time was north of that Mason-Dixon line. There were some cities in the South that were industrialized, but not to the degree that um, cities like New York and um, Philadelphia and Boston had been industrialized. So. Uh, economics the north was an industrial powerhouse the south their almost their entire economy was based around cotton um the growing the you know picking and, and selling of cotton for clothes uh and the economy was very different in the south and in the north uh the north there were there were definitely very rich tycoons who, who owned factories and had had sort of created a separation from the rest of the class, but there was a much more robust middle class. Uh, whereas in in southern states at the onset of the Civil War, um, there was sort of an aristocracy of these elite um, plantation owners who had who had all this wealth and all this power, um, and based their their wealth and power and lifestyle on a slave economy that that produced cotton and sold it. Um, and so their economy was a lot less stable, and it depended very, very much on uh, maintaining uh, the institution of slavery. And so when you look at economics as a cause of the Civil War, it's it's tied to this idea of slavery. If it wasn't for um, the, that system, then um, the South wouldn't exist as they know it. And so they were sort of fighting when when they talk about, you know, fighting for their way of life or fighting for their their ideals, you know. The truth is that their ideals are based on on this institution that's morally reprehensible. So then you can also look at representation um, because of the population difference. I think the North's population at the onset of the Civil War was something like 30 million as opposed to what we say 11 million for the South, except that the South's population was almost 50 percent enslaved people. Now, those enslaved people, quote unquote, were counted in representation. I think it was they counted as one eighth of a vote. And so uh, but still, in terms of representation in the House of Representatives, the South was very much outrepresented by the North. So they were losing their their ability to um, 
control Congress. In the Senate, one of the reasons that the Mason-Dixon line and the fight over new states coming into the Union being slave or free states was such a big deal was um, because you get two senators for every state. And so they were trying to maintain an equal representation in the Senate. Um, I know this is talking about a little bit of American government and how American government runs, but uh, representation was an issue, uh, and the the election that elected Lincoln, I think, sort of threw this over the top because uh, you know basically the entire South voted against him, uh, but they couldn't sway the election because no matter whether every single Southern state voted for one candidate or not, that candidate couldn't get elected because the North had so many more people, and uh, you know the the president is. Uh, connected to the number of representatives that that each state has and the electoral votes that that state has. Uh, so it was about representation as well. They felt like their way of life was not being represented. They didn't have any any meaningful say in the government. And that's one of the reasons that they, um, you know, tried to get out of the union. And then there's a sort of cultural uh, difference. You know, you look at the North and the South and the North has these sort of puritanical roots uh, and the South, uh, you know, they they saw themselves as, as Anglo-Saxon. They went back to the culture of England. But essentially, um, you know, when you look at, at it and how it's organized, it's sort of like um, aristocracy. You have these these essentially lords who have these plantations and all of this wealth, and they're sort of creating this new aristocracy imported from England over into um, America. And so uh, you have a real culture clash. Uh, between the two sides, and they they almost start to see themselves as different uh, other countries from each other. And I think that's one of the reasons that the whole thing sort of blows up. So, I, by the way, one of the problems with with the class is that we're going to have to gloss over everything. This is an overview. Um, I'm not doing anything justice today, but I want to get you thinking. I want to get you set in the mindset and, and sort of understand uh, some of the stuff that's going on. So now we'll just talk about outcomes quickly and then um, call this lecture done because I'm running out of time. Uh, so the outcomes of the war that I think are, are important that we're going to talk about in class. Um, arguably, as I said before, it's the first industrial war. Uh, we have railroads, we have factories. Um, you know, every every war that happened before this, even up until the time of Napoleon, um, Napoleon was during the Industrial Revolution. This one's after the Industrial Revolution. So we have sort of a, a mechanized warfare. We're producing arms and equipment at a faster rate than than ever before. We're uh, shipping soldiers down at a rate that's that's different. And so this war is it's sort of the precursor to World War One. Uh, you see a lot of changes in tactics. Um, it, it's a war that suddenly shifts from from being a war used to favor the attacker. Whoever whoever was aggressive had the initiative. They could do what they wanted and, uh, you know, dictate the outcomes of battles. Well, now with muskets that are much more accurate, with rifled cannons that are much more accurate, uh, with a longer range, uh, the tactics shift to um, the defender. And over the course of the war, attacks are going to be less and less successful. And the sides that are defending are going to be more and more successful. And you'll see trench warfare essentially develop uh, very early on. Soldiers find that if they hide behind a stone wall, they're much more effective than if they uh, stand out in the open and fire. And then they start to realize, hey, if you dig a little trench in the ground and sit behind it, you, you're protected and you can you know, decimate your opponent who's coming at you. And that essentially is World War I and, and what happens in World War I. So it's sort of a precursor to World War I and trench warfare. We also have the development of the first ironclads. You might argue the first sort of modern battleships. Um, the, one, the first one that has a rotating turret is uh, called the Monitor, and it's a Union battleship. Um, so we have that. We have this this major shift. So you can see again the precursor to World War One and the kinds of uh, naval warfare that will happen. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, you know, the freeing of the slaves in the South is a huge outcome of uh, the Civil War. Although oftentimes historians talk about it, or not historians, uh, his history books, which are sort of, uh, especially if they're designed for kids, they make it sound 
like it was this great panacea that that fixed everything and it's not at all um we have the reestablishment of the union the united states could have fractured into two smaller sides and that might have made it you know easy pickings for european powers uh but it did not um then we had the 13th amendment which officially uh freed the slaves and abolished slavery in the united states and that's wonderful uh but again didn't didn't fix everything um, immediately after the war. Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. We'll look at that. Uh, and we started something that was called Reconstruction, trying to reintegrate, um, you know, the South and integrate um, the African-American population into the South. And it was in, in large part a failure. Um, and, and even when you look at um, the abolishment of slavery, it gave rise to a new um, form of servitude called sharecropping, which in a lot of ways is slavery in everything but name. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of positive outcomes from the war, but people are people and cultures are cultures, and you can't change a culture by changing a law. It takes time, it takes um, effort, and uh, certainly, I think that this is is an example of that. So these are the things that we're going to be. Uh, I think it just gives you an overview and and some of the things that we'll be looking at uh, as we go through the course and and study um, the history. Uh, our first paper is going to be a compare and contrast paper, and I think there's a lot of of food for thought in this lecture for you. Um, you can start thinking about the two sides and the ways they're, they're similar and the ways they're different and start thinking about what angle you want to maybe come at this, this first paper from, or you want to look at um, ec economics, you want to look at industry, do you want to look at um, culture, do you want to look, I mean, th there's lots of different things that we can look at in contrast, you want to look at militaries, um, one of one of the interesting things, and I, I don't want to keep going on, but one of the interesting contrasts, for example, between the North and the South was um, that the South was a much more sort of military uh, culture. It was fashionable uh, for wealthy Southerners to send their um, sons to West Point or to Virginia Military Academy, uh, whereas wealthy Northern families tended to send their kids to Yale or Harvard. Um, or a lot of these Ivy League schools. And so there was a, a big military tradition in the South that was not present in the North. And actually that that was a big impact on the war itself because a lot of the experienced officers uh, with with quality tactics and leadership uh, were already in the South and that made the, the Southern Army uh, more battle ready and effective than the Northern Army for a long time until Northern officers gained that experience through hard lessons and losses and and we got rid of the ones who were ineffective uh so anyway i'm going to stop talking um but hopefully this gives you an overview of the war and i'm going to send a video um so i will attach in the classroom i will attach a 10 minute history video that maybe does as good a job or better job than i do at talking through sort of the basic gist of civil war history so that you you get a sense all right thanks